Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the most influential urban conservative talk show in America. It is the Exceptional Conservative Show live from the nation's capital. We are not ashamed of the good news of conservatism, for it is the power of liberation. First to the Republican and then the Socialist. This is your sneak peek at WNJC 1360 AM's Saturday's Big Show. Uh, it is none other than New Day Black and Red, featuring, of course, the underground professor, Dr. Michael Jones, and yours truly, the exceptional one, Kevin McClinton. Yes, we have a upbeat melody today. It's been a tough week, a hearty week, but if it doesn't kill you, is worth living. New Day Black and Red again on 1360 AM WNJC, the city of brotherly love, the Renaissance Superstation. Glad to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be bringing on in just a few moments the professor and our very special guest, Carrie Donovan. Carrie Donovan wants to talk with us tonight about her role as a social worker. She is a repentant social worker who has chosen conservatism to save the nation. But as everyone knows, before we make that big jump into our conversations with the best of the best, uh, we find our right hand, we put it over our heart, and we pledge allegiance to the United States of America. Join me, please. That's what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we should do with our children every single day, even before they go off to school, along with prayer. Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, to our very fascinating show. Uh, it is New Day Black and Red. It gives you not only a constitutional view of the issues of the day, but also it provides you a spiritual view. Uh, look at the issues of the day as well and so we will be bringing up in just a few moments none other uh, than the underground professor Dr. Michael Jones and our very special guests for this particular weekend uh, none other than Carrie Donovan I met Carrie uh, at Civitas Institute's conservative leadership conference uh, down in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, what a wonderful woman to have met. Great speaker uh, and just a very sincere heart, mind, and soul. Uh, there we go. We want to bring on our great. Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. There you. are two participants in the conference. There are two participants in the conference yourself. who have tired oh, of listening right. to the music. And, of course, everyone knows that when you go on the air, as soon as the mic hits you, everything's hot. And so you are live uh, on New Day Black and Red. Uh, and this is being recorded. And the great city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, PA, uh, home okay. to Rick Trader, uh, the benevolent dictator. Want to introduce to some, present to others, uh, the beautiful and brilliant Carrie Donovan. Good evening. 
It's a great talk pleasure talking with you. Hello. Oh, so what we have <laughs> okay. Uh, uh <laughs> not the beautiful and the brilliant, but certainly brilliant and handsome. Uh, Dr. Michael Jones of the Underground Professor Show, who is joining us for New Day uh, Black and Red. Good day, sir. It's a pleasure having you on the air with me. Well, who'd you expect to have on there instead of me? I, no, I don't have anyone expecting, uh, instead of you, expecting, expecting be with you, of course. Uh, Carrie Donovan is supposed to be joining us, and I don't know if she's backed out at this particular juncture out of fear. Uh, well, I was talking to my chick on there earlier and saying you came to interrupt us. I am so sorry. I did not mean to interrupt you and the hot chick. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so Carrie Donovan is supposed to be joining us. Uh, Carrie Donovan has joined us. Good day. How you doing? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. What a, what a way to start, huh? That. <laughs> it's a wonderful way to start on New Day Black and Red. <laughs> this is the first time that we're trying this in which we are... No, actually, the second time we interviewed a Supreme Court uh, a justice candidate uh, a little uh -huh. while back. So you're joining uh -huh. the Hall of Fame here tonight, Carrie. Yes, I needed that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. I'm fired up. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dr. Michael Jones with us tonight. Uh, I, of course, I'm Kevin Clinton. I carry the water for the professor. I make sure the green M&Ms are in his room uh, and that Mandy Sue has her beer. Did Mandy Sue get her beer for the evening? Yes, but we have a complaint, Mandy Sue and I. In the M&M bowl, not all of them are M. Some of them have W's on them. <laughs> I am. I apologize, sir, profusely. I know that this may be the end of my career, but I I will work it's diligently. Right <laughs> diligently. Oh, right <laughs> um, now, uh, Carrie. Without further ado, it was a great honor and privilege talking with you down in Cary, North Carolina. Um, it was awesome. My pleasure. My honor. It was, awesome. uh, we were standing and talking with none other than uh, Colonel James Wyatt uh, in the Nanny yeah. Helen Burroughs project. Uh, and I'll give people information about that a little bit later on. But uh, you, mm -hmm. you were stark. Uh, you brought a light to me. And it was a very great conference. There's very few great conferences that I attend. But you were definitely mm -hmm. a beam of light at that particular uh -huh. conference. Uh, and so I want you, I want you to tell everyone who you are, uh, what you do, uh, and, and you know just give some foundational of Carrie Donovan. What what does Carrie Donovan do today? Well, thank you so much. That, that is so sweet of you to say. And it was an excellent conference by Vivid Haas here in Raleigh. They're fantastic, and you were awesome. Um, but well, I I like to say that I'm just a stay at home mom and a homeschool three kids. Um, I try to stay politically active as much as I can in working for conservative candidates here in Raleigh um, with my North Carolina GOP is usually how I find them. And, um, and I like to do, you know, whatever I can do to volunteer to help them with their campaigns, to get them into office. Wow. Um, I'm a volunteer and a stay-at-home mom and an ex-social worker. So, um, I do, mostly the things that I do are sort of on my own. Um, I have a, a good friend who does a lot of different ministry and outreach, and I try to join him when I have time doing things with the homeless. Um, anything with children. Children's a big concern of mine. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, all over the place. Not really, not really organized too much, but whatever I can, you know, find time to do is what I do. I'm just well, an American. You no know, well. You can never say just a mother, just a homeschooler, and just an American. Those all they 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 can't be preceded by the word just. Uh, you are a great mom, a great homeschooler, and I'm advocating. Uh, and, and the professor knows this uh, around the world, around the country, especially that uh, people need to con concentrate on homeschooling 
tremendously uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and making sure that I, I agree. kids go to school. Um, mm-hmm. But for the sake of the professor this evening, uh, we had a great conversation okay. down in Cary. Uh, yeah, it was better yeah. than it was better than the one it's that like you just had. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you are you there? I'm here. Okay, yeah. great. It's well, a prof- good radio right there, huh? Okay, it's the professor here. Let's see if I can figure out what's going on here. <sighs> okay. No worries. Um, yeah. <laughs> no audio. No worries. Uh, okay. Okay. And the professor goes, and he doesn't know that I was listening to him the whole time. Uh, he'll be back. No. <laughs> My first time on the radio, and this is a lot of fun. This <laughs> is. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, I love this technology. Uh, <laughs> you're listening yeah. to you're listening to New Day Black and Red. Uh, we are broadcasting out of the city of Brotherly Love, Philadelphia, PA. This is a very special show uh, because normally you just hear the professor and myself. But the wonderful thing uh, tonight, uh, as we are being joined again by the professor, who's probably irate over the green M&Ms in his uh, trailer. Uh, very upset about that. Uh, but I wonder... Well, eventually... You're going to run out of all this new technology, Ken, and you're going to have to go back to BTR. No, never. Okay, so... <laughs> you, you say that never. Never Facebook, never BTR, never YouTube, never video this, video that, Skype. You're running out of technology. <laughs> you're going to be back to lasering against the surface of the moon to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. Uh, thank you, sir. I apologize for all my technical blunders. I'm working on it. Working on it. Uh, <laughs> now, um, Carrie, you were you were a social worker at one time in your life, and I want you to give us a um, give us your your back the story of how you became a social worker. Uh, because I think it's very important at a time period when we're having individuals run for election and tell us that they can give us everything that we want with no consequence <laughs> and how that has dramatically impacted also urban America. Uh, so so please proceed. Let us Tell us all about your background. Well, yeah. I, oh, I hope it's, somebody finds that. this interesting. Um, so, well, I decided to go into social work, I think. I grew up outside of uh, Detroit, southern Detroit, in um, the suburbs of Detroit. And I don't, you know, I don't know when it would have started, but at some point in my childhood, I started noticing, you know, I just started having some ethical concerns about um, the way that different people were treated. Maybe it was a lesson that I had in school, you know, being taught about slavery or issues like that. Um, of course, you know, the, the, the Holocaust, the things that would just play heavy on a, on a child's heart. And so, um, and also as a Christian, I started to, just to feel a lot of compassion and empathy for people, um, for all people, but especially for people who I felt like really had gone through something major um, that might have been holding them back from their potential. And so I went to college and I was uh, trying to decide, you know, what to go into, what to, what to major and what to specialize in. And I'm not sure you know, exactly how I would have ended up in social work, but at some point, you know, somebody either said to me, hey, how about social work since you're concerned about people? Um, maybe I discovered it on my own. I don't remember exactly, but I went into the School of Social Work, and I felt like that, had, that was a really good match for me because the things that they were telling me were things about how they were going to be helping these populations of people who I felt just deep compassion for. Um, and so I went through, you know, my various social work classes. Um, at some point, the social work classes started to take a little bit of a turn um, into more community organizing, you know, Solinsky, you know, stuff, which um, I think what happened was sort of my ears got tickled by the idea of using the helping people into, you know, this is how we're going to help people. And so, you know, 
you know, once you start getting into that junior, senior year in college, you really, you just want to get out of there. <laughs> get your yeah. degree, right, and get out of there. And so, um, you know, I think at some point I decided maybe social work wasn't really what I wanted to do, but at that point I was already invested and I just wanted to kind of get out. Um, so I guess that, you know, that's kind of how I discovered the world of social work. Now, they were, they were training you, uh, and, and you recognized through the training, they were uh, using Sololinsky, uh yes. and, and those particular principles. Were they principles that you were aware of before you entered um, the liberal arts training? No, no, not at all. But they were the, the principles when they came up in my junior and senior year, especially my senior year, um, because they were more concentrated, were things that I was um, I was confused by and I was frustrated with, and I didn't fully um, support them. And I would buck against them, and of course, you know, it was well, I would get threatened with, you know, you're going to fail this class, and. You know, I would write a reaction paper that the professor didn't like, and I'd have to go back and rewrite it into something, you know, more appropriate um, of what what would be acceptable. And of course, again, at that point, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a good grade, and I'm trying, I'm thinking about getting out and getting a job. So, um, but they certainly weren't things that I would have ever thought about. No, they were introduced to me in those specific classes. Okay. But they were playing upon my. They were playing upon my spiritual beliefs. Okay. Definitely. So I mean, like, we're going to help people. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, and that, that's that's where I want to go with this. Um, and the professor, mm -hmm. the professor who has experience in the uh, liberal arts college uh, background, and can probably chime okay. in, chime in here. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned the point that they recognize. Uh, as they do with students, your desire to do something noble, your desire to give something back, your desire to be a help uh, to those mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that have not been as graciously abundant as you have been receiving in terms of college. Uh, Professor, let me just ask you here so so that so that uh, Mandy Sue can give her point of view. Uh, <laughs> But professor, do you find that happening in colleges across uh, across the country? Say that again. So that's what your question was. Uh, okay. Uh, question here, sir. Are liberal professors tearing up the hearts and minds of students because uh, they simply want to do something good? Uh, the the students themselves. No. They're not. No. Progressive ones, progressive ones are, but liberal ones like me aren't. Okay, there you go. So the progressive ones are tearing the. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, I, I agree. Yeah. He's a classical so, liberal. Yeah, they, I mean, some of them just don't know yeah. any better that they're teaching the wrong thing. They they go to these schools, and their professors teach them, and they get degrees, and they go out, and they have no idea. Think, uh, they have no idea. Think Schoenig to this. Um, that this is what's been happening, and that they have the wrong information and they're passing it on. They actually believe what they're teaching, and they, you know, they're just really they're useful idiots for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them think they're doing good. I mean, and and you've heard me talk before, Ken, that that conservatives and progressives both say they want to help people, uh, but it's how we help. You know, one of us wants to teach them how to fish. The other one wants to buy them a fish dinner and tell them to vote for them. And uh, <laughs> they, they want to eat. And so we both we measure it in different in different ways. And both sides think the other side's not helping. Uh, that they're being part of the problem, or they're cold and don't care. So, and so yes, you know. And this is how we manage to uh, to create the situation we're in today. And as you know, anything about economics and government, if you want more of something, subsidize it. So if you like poor people, subsidize them, and you'll get more. You'll get more poor people. Mo Poe. <laughs> Mo -po. I believe Mo Poe is number two on the ballot this year. Uh, <laughs> Carrie Donovan. Right, that's a lot Mo Poe. <laughs> Carrie Donovan is with us today uh, from North Carolina. She was a former social worker. Uh, trained to help people and 
as we're going through in our conversation, um, there are many individuals who have been trained as social workers. Uh, and I, I, Howard University is one of those home camps. In fact, one of the first social work colleges in the country, starting back in 1932, uh, where the government came in and said, listen, we'll teach you how to help your people. Just put your security and trust in us. So uh, I want to go now, you have graduated, you have been trained uh, by those who have your good interests at heart. Uh, you see their view, they see your view, you, and their view is that you better pass this class by, uh, by agreeing <laughs> with me. Uh, so what happens after you graduate from college? Well, so after I graduated, I had an internship with um, a congressman in Michigan, and so I was sort of interested in politics, um, <clears throat> and I, I learned a number of things, um, but what happened was I moved out to Los Angeles, and I ended up working um, with my uncle for a little while and then getting a social work job, mm -hmm. and that was about, I guess, whatever year the riot. 91, 92, the Los Angeles riot? Yes. Um, okay. I, I lived in West Hollywood at that time, and I was a social worker. I was working with developmentally disabled adults doing job training for them, doing job training with them and organizing them to work. And that was a fantastic experience. Um, it was sort of cut short, though, by the riot. And I think what happened was, um, during those riots, I really had my eyes open to what I was watching in television and hearing people talk about. Um, and I, I just, I just had an awakening of this idea of social work. We are, I, I always try to avoid jobs in welfare, but you know, I had certain clients who were on welfare and things like that, and I just had an awakening that I'm not doing anything to help anybody. Wow! And pushing welfare on them because wow. look at these things that are happening in this city in Los Angeles, and these people and what they're saying. Maybe and, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh sure, okay. Sorry, I just my first time on the radio, so I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a geek. Like, should I be quiet now or speak? Oh, no. um, so I, I, you know, I just turned away. I started to realize. Everybody hear my voice. Everybody should be silent. <laughs> <laughs> At least I think it was a pastor and the whole thing. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, you know, I believe the Lord put it on my mind. He showed me things. And yes. And I, I, I had situations where I was learning that these human beings were doing things to survive that was not helping them get a job and to be free, be independent, be, you know, self-actualized. To live their own lives, they were being burdened by this welfare, and it just you know a number of a series of different events happened, and I started to realize that it's unethical and immoral to trap them with welfare. Now, now so hold, like hold one second, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Hold one second, Carrie, because mm -hmm. what you're saying here is monumental to a lot of down low listeners that I have, and a lot of urban listeners and, and listeners around the world. They can't conceive what you just said that it is unethical and also immoral that it seems yes. it seems it's Im yeah it's unchristian to put people on welfare uh, and, and we have a person who's running Donald Trump and I, I don't know you know one side or the other I, I, I I'm a Ted Cruz guy but uh, the bottom line is we have one guy who says I have a big heart and I want to take care of everybody. How was it trying to take care of everybody in Los Angeles, California? You no, know, it was just, it, that experience was so monumental to my understanding of the world. I, you know, it was so naive. And I saw this. I, it, it just, it blew my mind what I was seeing. And, um, can you give us? I mean, I can't even put into words. Can you give it to give us examples of where you began to feel the testing of your very soul? It was it the teenage girl who came in and said, "I am due and entitled 
uh, to public housing because I'm having a baby out of wedlock. Uh, was it something like that? No. Mm -hmm. no. I, it was a situation. Um, I was working for him and finding him a job. So um, I, w I had a, there was a JTPA grant, and they decided that the little business decided to expand it from developmentally disabled to felons, which is like the world of social work, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden a felon is developmentally disabled. I don't think so. But anyway, um, so they gave me the felons, and I said, okay, fine, I'll do. I'll work with the felons. I mean, they're children of God. I'm, I'm fine with that. So I started working for, with a felon who had, you know, a record of trafficking in cocaine. And I was going around Los Angeles trying to find a job for him. I mean, I, I just spent so much energy and time trying to find out, like, what would he be interested in doing? Because that, to me, meant he was going to stay on the job. And that was really I'm important. Right state, sir. <laughs> and everybody was kind of blowing off and saying, you know, like, why are you wasting so much time on him? Um, and then, like, because I want to understand him and have a job, keep a job, pay his bills. I think that he will be healed that way. And so, um, working with him, I go all around the city of Los Angeles. You know, I'm a job developer, and I, I can go into that later, but it's, that's kind of a long story. But I, I'm a job developer, and I'm, I'm hunting at jobs, and he said he likes animals. I think he was just probably blowing me off. I like animals, so go find him a job. I convinced the, the LA Zoo, give, will you please give my client a job? I will be there at this job, search the whole thing, and they get money back and, you know, all this stuff. So they say, okay, fine. So I set him up in this interview, and he didn't go in the interview. And I was like, you know, talking to him afterwards, saying, how can you think on the interview? I really put a lot of energy into getting you that job, that position. And he looked at me in the face and he said, I can make $10,000 in a day. Why would I work for $12 an hour? And I was like, I'm working for $5 an hour with a college degree. I mean, and you know, at that moment, it just, I mean, I had to give it to him. Really, why would he? Why would he? Why would he take that job? Yes, Professor. Go right ahead. What were you going to say? Huh? Oh, I forget now. Uh, Maggie, she just chemically attacked me. Okay, well, okay. Good. All right. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> no, you know, that's, that's the mentality. Either they can get paid not to work, or they can <laughs> do nefarious crimes and get paid a lot more. But what I said was, is your $12 an hour job at the zoo means you don't get arrested if you get caught you know, working at the zoo. Mm -hmm. and, right. uh, but a lot of them will weigh the risk and say, yeah, it's worth the risk of doing the time uh, to live the life, to get the money. Instant gratification is easy. You know, we, we don't preach that uh, there's an edification in doing a job and doing it well. And we don't teach uh, you know, following the laws and the Constitution and being Christian. And, and you know, the funny thing is, if you've ever been with a lot of these felons, most of them are very religious, <laughs> but they don't see their acts as unchristian. Yeah, you just uh, just right. Well, I uh, oh, sorry. Go go right ahead. Go right ahead. Well, I was going to say I I've come to really you know play with this idea and really understand that you know I could have compassion and empathy for this man in that situation. I could understand what he was saying without excusing his behavior and without being you know, enabling his poor behavior, I could actually understand what he was saying in the sense that where were, where were his opportunities to be an entrepreneur? Where were the free market and the, you know, the rogue... He was one, though, wasn't he? Invest in him. You know, this was a very smart man. Yeah, yeah. This was a very okay. smart man. I mean, I'm sorry. No, I was saying he was an entrepreneur. You just you got to redefine it. I mean, he was out there selling a product and had high right. demand and made a lot of money on it. This man, yeah, these people are not idiots uh, for the most mm -hmm. part. They're ingenious. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I struggled with with the ethical, again, the ethical and moral consequences of here's a human being, here's a man. I can understand. I, I can understand that he wants to be an entrepreneur. I can understand he's intelligent. And he's, why would he go work at the zoo? He's an intelligent man who's used to making a lot of money. Um, but what he's doing is causing harm in that community, and it's harming children. And so I have to go with, we have to, we need to protect the children yeah. um, in those communities. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things that I was noodling around in my head during these riots in Los Angeles. And, yeah. Wow. So... 
after after the riots and after this particular moment, uh, you began to think that you know what I this is not what God would have me to do. It, it, it's not an opportunity for Him as much as it's an opportunity for me to escape and get out of this particular type of system. Um, what is the penalty for individuals who are in the welfare system? As far as you, you recognize with other social workers and others who uh, worked as hard as you to get people out of poverty, what, what are the penalties behind uh, the social, social work system? Um, do you mean of getting out of, I'm sorry, of getting out of the social work? Or well, well, for, uh, OG, what we're perpetuating on people? Uh, exactly. It, it, the, the, what was being yeah. put on the right. people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I think that the, one of the major concerns is, is that these people don't have an investment in America. And therefore, it's like, you know, the Bible. We can't, they can't reap any of the benefits of America if they're not investing in America. So we talk about patriotism and love of country and, you know, we feel these foundational you know, pulls at our heartstring, we're proud of our flag, we feel, you know, connected and brotherhood and all these great things. They don't just feel those things. They're not invested in America. They're just taking from America. It hurts self-esteem. It hurts their sense of, of self-determination. It hurts their ability to be self-actualized. They can't learn from any mistake, and they can't take care of themselves. We're telling them they can't take care of themselves. And so there's a hopelessness. Many of them, like you said, are... are you know, spiritual in a way, but they also don't even feel they can be go to church and be children of God. And that bothers me, and that's an ethical concern that I have about what the field of social work is doing to people, to human beings. So I think it's just a, a, just a general hopelessness. Yes. And now, hopelessness. Now, there, there are social workers, and we're talking to Carrie Donovan tonight, a former social worker who is choosing conservatism to save the nation. Uh, I am at the ready uh, with uh, the professor, Dr. Michael Jones, the underground professor that he is, my good friend, uh, who gives a constitutional and I give a spiritual viewpoint on the issues of the day. I'm Kevin McClinton, the exceptional one. Uh, talking with Carrie, we already established three basic Don't points. I'm, I'm sorry? A legend, good friend. You are. Oh my goodness! I, when I get to Dallas, I'm gonna eat a. I'm going. <laughs> well, that would require you to call me or something, or return a phone call. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna get fired every single week. I tell you. Uh, <laughs> we established three points here that there is no investment in America by putting people on welfare. Uh. It hurts the self-esteem and self-determination of the individual. And it provides a system of hopelessness. Now, some people would say, listen, Carrie, uh, you got this all wrong. Uh, we are helping Leroy get his self-esteem. Because when you work 60 hours a week on your 40-hour week job, trying to make certain that he gets a job, uh, you have helped him, and now he can help himself. How detrimental mm -hmm. is that to, to, to Leroy, the person who's really not trying? Well, he never gets to learn that, he never gets to learn about the power that he has and or the abilities they have. Mm -hmm. He never gets to take care of himself, and that's like a hierarchy of needs. You know, I talk to social workers, and to liberals, and or, I mean, not classic liberals, professor, to uh, new liberals, new liberal liberals. And I say to classic them, liberals. Classic, <laughs> liberals. Yes, classic liberals are good, and new liberals are, um, they're, they might be good hearted, but they're actually being detrimental. I think I lost my point somewhere there. Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> the, uh, I'm talking about new, new libs and and how uh, a term. <laughs> generous of other people's money. Oh, but, you know, in, 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 we, we talk about hierarchy of needs, and you can ascribe to different political, 
you know, psychological points of view, you know, systems and ways of organizing thoughts. But basically, we know that people have to have a hierarchy of needs, and that's a you know technical term. But basically, people have needs. That is well. Humans, humans have needs. And we can call it Maslow or whatever, but we, we do. We have needs. And one of the needs that we have is to solve our own problems and to take care of ourselves. And if you ever allow a person to take care of themselves, they never will mature and they'll never have any, any pride in their own work. This is, I call, an ethical and moral dilemma. It's not right for us to do that to people. Well, church folk will say, <clears throat> listen, we're doing God's work here. God would want this person to receive our help, our social handout. And, 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 and look, what, look, what, look how I feel helping him. So this can't be wrong, right? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's about how we feel. It makes you, you know, it makes them feel good. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean. Well, here, here we go, Carrie. You decide yeah. to get out of social work and you mm -hmm. choose conservatism. Now, how did this flash of lightning hit you to choose to be a conservative? So, um, <laughs> you know, I started listening to, like, Ollie North and Ted Rush Limbaugh, and Bond. I'm like, darn it, those guys are making some sense. I don't, you know, this was back when I was still getting my degree. So it's already like, oh, the, some of the things that they're saying make sense. I saw Clarence Thomas being ripped apart for these stupid things. I'm like, I, I don't know about these liberals. They don't, they don't seem to um, be ethical. This is <laughs> an ethical concern of mine. Um, but I think what it really went back to was when I was in kindergarten, I read a book called Sam the Minutemen. And I started, you know, I always had this theme of the Daughters of the American Revolution, which I am a member of, running in my background, running in my, you know, the back of my mind of what is America and why did people fight for America? And so um, I got laid off from my job and I had some really, you know, some time to really think about what I was doing and, you know, what direction I was going in. I decided not to get back into social work, but instead clean houses. Because wow. I really started to believe I'm, I'm, if I go back into social work, I'm like stealing an American dream away from a person. This was just a really heavy concern of mine. And so it was a sense of patriotism that my grandmother and my, my grandfather, who served in various, you know, wars, military, veterans, that you know really that just really started to come out in the forefront for me and of course that's it you know those are conservative wow. ideals and concepts and they're always much more respectful to veterans yes. than any neoliberal i've ever seen so you know i just started gravitating to those places where conservatives would be hanging out Carrie, I'm going to tell you right now, we've had politicians on our individual shows. The Underground Professor Show is the number one urban American show in America. Uh, and the Exceptional Conservative <laughs> Show is the oh, number right. yeah, <laughs> the, no, the number one show uh, amongst rural people. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, it's vice versa. But the uh, bottom line is that we hear politicians all the time talking about uh, the general welfare, helping people, reaching out and lifting people up out of poverty. And you made one of yeah. the most pronounced statements in the past two to three minutes that we've probably heard on our show from anybody that's come on, stealing an American <laughs> dream from someone. Uh, yeah. That is, Wow powerful stealing an american dream for someone now some liberal who's sitting back and i live in the city of liberals uh who sip tea mm -hmm. sip tea at the starbucks and tell me uh on their apple phones as they're texting that uh capitalism is a sin uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. <laughs> how is it um that we're fair something that we're trying to use to help people 
really stealing the American dream. Uh, I, I mean, that's a very sincere charge against someone. Yes, it is. And it's because I go back to the conservative principles of free market, of small government, which means, you know, we, we, we need to have sensible business regulations um, and entrepreneurship. I go back to those are, you know, those are firmly held conservative points of view that those are the things that make America great and strong. Um, and those are the things that would benefit rural and urban people. Mm. Entrepreneurship, small business, and let's cut out the crazy business regulations that prevent people from having their own business. Wow. <clears throat> wow. You're listening to WNJC 1360, Drive Time Radio in Philly, Delaware, and New Jersey. This is the Underground Professor, and you have the Exceptional Conservative Show, and we have a guest tonight. Kim, tell us who. Our guest tonight is none other than the beautiful and brilliant Carrie Donovan, uh, who we met at the Civitas Leadership, uh, Civitas Institute's uh, Conservative Leadership Conference in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, and we are just... Uh, <laughs> the, the professor sounded very professional. There we go. Change of pace. <laughs> um, I, I am just... I'm talking to my blind dog. Excuse me. Y'all won't listen. <laughs> <laughs> we are just enamored with you this particular evening because you are speaking to a populace of people who have been convinced, even by Republicans, that welfare is an essential good. And now, we all know that in urban America, uh, there are very high rates of minority poverty. But when we take a look at the entire sphere of America, uh, white are twice as likely to be on welfare than than blacks and so many people would say hey wait a minute this is a racial thing you're really you're 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 hurting the races by saying this kind of stuff and and believing this kind of stuff poor people especially black people bernie sanders says that you white people don't understand poverty uh poor people right. need a handout uh, is that true that we do need handouts in america You know, <laughs> you know, I, idealistically, we would have churches that would help people. We would have neighbors helping each other, and we wouldn't have to be burdened on the taxpayer to help. Um, of course, there is going to be situations where you're going to have people who are going to need a hand out for a little while in order to build themselves into, you know, their independence. Um, I, as a Christian, do believe that that's the right thing to do, and I think that churches should be responsible for that. I don't think it's a taxpayer, excuse me, I don't think it's a taxpayer um, duty. Actually, if we go to the founding fathers and we go to the foundations of the country, that it's anything should be a, tax pay, a burden on the taxpayer. Um, but it would be my choice. And I do believe that we have enough charity to help, you know, help women with children. If there wasn't enough, I mean, those are, you know, those are kind of big issues for me, just a little stay-at-home mom to try to figure out. Um, the way, you know, I'm not running for public office either, so <laughs> I want to believe that there would be enough charity. I want to believe, you know, that people would be good enough to help their neighbor out. But well, it's not, it used to be that way, but the government took that job away from the churches and charities. Right. And the government has done a horrible job of helping anybody because they just keep people in this system. So they're not ever getting... I mean, there are some who do get off. It, you know, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't use platitudes ever, but it just seems like they get stuck. Yeah, I, I want to ask you that uh, in, in terms of the government's operations because uh, the whole the whole gambit is in order for pro for poverty programs to exist you have to keep people in poverty am i correct on that right, <laughs> right. i mean they're, they're you know so social workers are going to lose their job if all of the poor people go and get jobs 
What I would prefer to see if I, you know, if I could be president, if I could have it my way, what I would do is say, okay, fine, you have a certain amount of time, you know, for, for you know, to have this kind of help. But we also need education, we need job training, we need skills training. Um, it, to fix what we have is, a, you know, in theory, we can talk about in theory, but, you know, it, it, to be honest, to fix what we have, we have to help people out. Mm -hmm. But why can't we also teach them how to get a job and help them do job training and then set them on their way? You know, I, one of the things that I found in the District of Columbia, and the professor might be able to acknowledge this down in Dallas, but uh, there are at least 30 or 40 people or organizations um, that provide job training. Uh, 13 weeks and people are paid something like four or $500 for every week that they're in there while they're on welfare. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, they don't get a job because all they learn how to do maybe is the green job thing where you change filters or uh, you learn how to uh, make beds and you already knew that or uh, you learn how to shake somebody's right. hand. So really, you're not helping them get a job. They're not involved in the in the workforce rather than training them to be, you know, get into the tech area or, you know, become desk uh, supervisor. Well, not mm -hmm. desk supervisor, but desk tech supporters, you know, which would take uh, but and also get a better result. Right, and that's, that's part of the reason why it's sort of my mission to show people, listen, the conservative branch of the Republican Party is really where you want to emphasize. You need to come into this area. You need to make your voice heard here because these people are the people who understand entrepreneurship and free markets and things where it, we could make the whole entire system work. But instead of piecemealing, like, okay, I'm going to throw a job training program at you that trains you how to make beds. Because, you know, <laughs> these, cause there's nothing wrong with their brains. These are people who could run their own businesses. They could have grocery stores in the areas of poverty-stricken, you know, uh, um, cities and towns where there aren't people who can get to the grocery store, well, they could have run the grocery store. Why aren't we training them to do jobs where they can use their brains instead of just, you know, there's nothing wrong with, we need people to make beds. But they, we can't have a line of people making beds and no one running a grocery store. Why can't we say, what do you want to do? What are you good at? What are you gifted at? What, what are you interested in doing? What is wrong with saying to a welfare recipient, what are you interested in doing in the world? <laughs> well, see, that's not a waste of time to me. That's valuable to find out. That's a human being with gifts, skills, experiences. So, um, again, it's an ethical and moral yeah. problem to just set people up to do mundane jobs that are beneath their um, intelligence or skill level or um, interest. Does that make sense? Exactly. Professor, I want to ask you quickly here. Is it welfare a form of communism? <laughs> well, it's certainly a form of enslavement, right? mm -hmm. uh, and it's a form of wealth transfer, which makes it, uh, it's, uh, you can't really say it's communist or socialist because it depends on who owns the means of production. Okay. But it is tyranny, it is fascist, and where you, you take wealth from productive people and you give it to non-productive people, whether they deserve it or not. And in our country, being a country of the rule of law and bound by constitutions, uh, limited powers, and enumerated rights uh, uh, and, and powers, uh, the question is where in the Constitution does it give government the authority to take money from people in Texas that are working and give it to people who aren't working in Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. uh, it simply doesn't exist. And it's unethical, it's immoral, as the guest said, but it also is unconstitutional. And... But, you know, what are you going to do? It's what we do. Awesome. Now, Carrie, you right now are working in North Carolina. You are a homemaker uh, and as well a homeschooler. Um, but you do something a little mm -hmm. bit more than that. And that's how I met you at the Nanny Helen Burroughs Project table with Colonel James Wyatt. Tell me, tell us all, what exactly do you do in North Carolina? 
Well, I I like to support candidates, conservative candidates, who are in line with you know what I believe. Yes. So I I do campaigning, I do polling, I do phone calling, I I do you know greeting, um, whatever whatever I can do to help get candidates into office that I really believe are going to allow me to hold them accountable. Because if I work for a uh, a candidate, I expect that I'm going to be able to say, hey, listen, you're not doing what you said that you're going to do. So I want a pro-homeschooling, small government, um, conservative, liberty-minded, um, small business, you know, pro-small business um, candidate. And then I just go and you, I volunteer. So I volunteer. <laughs> so, so you, volu you volunteer in North Carolina. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are mm -hmm. running for office down there who are conservatives that we found at the leadership conference uh, that was given yeah. by civitas. Uh And in terms of doing that, there's someone in North Carolina who's saying right now, gee, Carrie is so energetic. She's so powerful. She is just so great. She's on the air and she's giving her conservative point of views. She, she has a great background. Uh, she's just a champion. And I'm nothing like that. It's nothing I can do to actually change anything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell us in four or five minutes exactly why that person should get up off their duff and help you change North Carolina. Awesome. Well, I, I try to spend a lot of time encouraging other people to do what I'm doing. And all I'm doing is, uh, you know, just <laughs> volunteering for candidates. Um, I do spend time, I think that I, I talked to you about, it, I went down to a place called Moore Square. Yes. Um, I did before there was a feeding ordinance and I, and I just went and sat with people who are homeless and listened to them um, and just wanted to hear their, you know, hear what, what was going on in their minds and what they needed. Um, but I'm just, I, that's why I say I'm just a stay-at-home mom, but I'm not going to give up because I love America. And so, and I, and I want my children to grow up in a country where people are not denied the American dream. So it's very important to me, and I try to encourage other people, listen, you can do what I do. I just go to meetings. I just volunteer for candidates that I believe in, and I make sure I tell them, if I work to get you into office, I'm going to hold you accountable when you get into office. So I pay attention. I read online. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to understand, like, where do I jump in and get involved? And I say, just jump in and get involved. And just do it and start talking to people. Um, but I'm only just a stay-at-home mom. I mean, I only have as much power as I can get from when I go out the door and get involved. Just like everybody else, I don't have any special, any special skills or anything. Just stay-at-home mom. <laughs> it, you know, and that just say we gotta get rid of. Uh, we're talking to Gary Donovan, uh, who is a great uh, star on the rise in, in terms of the conservative movement, especially in North Carolina. Um, sincere, uh, just effectual, and just a beautiful woman of God. Uh, great homeschooler and humble. You're very humble. Uh, but it, with your permission, I, I want to put your information in our chat roll tonight because I, I want everyone to friend you. Uh, and. <laughs> Because uh, that's just the kind of guy I am. Uh, besides, I, I got out of the, I got out of the habit of uh, putting people's names on the bathroom walls. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm relieved. <laughs> well, no, I won't even go there. <laughs> I'm in North Carolina. Don't forget. <laughs> hey, hey, what about that bathroom thing in North Carolina? Because people need to know. What about uh, that bathroom thing? <laughs> oh. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> are we really in the country where there are people who don't have jobs and our concern is if people, you know, who's going to use which bathroom and it is driving me crazy. Like, but what about the jobs? Can I <laughs> talk about jobs? <laughs> I don't care about the bathrooms. I don't have jobs. <laughs> You know, I, I'm concerned about the bathrooms because, quite frankly, I, I don't want to walk in and see uh, uh, big boy Jeff uh, over the urinal wearing a dress, I, you know, because he felt like a man for a moment. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my 
know. I just, I just have to pray. We're going to get through this. We got to fight the fight. Professor, I uh, want to give you the last opportunity of question for Carrie or comment for Carrie uh, or encouragement. Well, keep up the good fight. I believe that homeschooling is where they'll save this country. Because mm -hmm. if they can get the youths of society of America, the youths of America, freedoms and liberties, and if there's a difference between those two words, then I think we're on the right path. I have a final question for you, uh, Carrie, uh, as we come to the end of this segment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, then I have to play uh, commercials, which the professor abhors, uh, <laughs> before we go over to the second half. Uh, and I thank you so much for coming on the air. Um, but what would you like to say to the urban social worker, the one who shows up at 8 o'clock in the morning, actually 8.15 in the morning, and there's a line around yeah. the corner, uh, a whole block of single mothers with children even who have been out there since six o'clock in the morning uh, mm -hmm. who are looking to fill out their applications for an extension of food stamps and everything. What is it that you want to say to her? Well, I want to say to her that no one is against her and no one thinks that she's doing the wrong thing. But for her to take some opportunities to really consider what she's doing and if she's really fulfilling the promise of America in handing out welfare. And wow. if she could take some time to pray for the people who are standing in line, those, those people have needs and they need to be met and we can't just have people lying in the streets dying. Nobody wants that. But to really consider is this really the promise of America to be handing out welfare and keeping those moms in that cycle? I'm going to tell you, for this being your first time on the air, you are a great professional. I am so very proud of you, Carrie. Wow. And we love your message. Your message you. needs to be heard all around the world, and tonight it was. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, stop stealing the American dream from people trying to help them. Help them find the American dream. Carrie they Donovan. Were, they were win. Huh? Thank you. Carry on that wayward win. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And hope you have a great successful run of your show. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And God bless you, Carrie. We'll be talking with you real soon. Hey, awesome. I look forward to it. Thanks. Carrie Donovan, a social worker, <laughs> repentant social worker who is spreading the message, the good news of conservatism, far and wide, people. We'll be right back with more of the best of New Day Black and Red. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I almost went there. <laughs> with the underground professor as I sit at his feet in the second half of our program and we talk about what good are the presidential candidates for the race to the middle class? <laughs> I'm going with Bernie Sanders. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I love me some Bernie. Feel the burn. Uh, and I am the exceptional one, Kevin Clinton. We'll be back. Bernie right? Supreme. <laughs> Bernie Supreme, Ken. <laughs> really? My name is Chris Brown. I'm the executive chef of a few restaurant. And today I'm walking you through some of the meals that we prepare here. <laughs> We're making a pizza. We're using a fresh Italian sausage. And then we cook here and slice it up. Our pizza dough is in house made. Our pizza sauce is in house made. So everything is fresh and ingredients. This is our Thai curry chicken. Uh, the sauce is made with coconut milk and the Thai red curry. It is juicy chicken thighs as well as some mixed vegetables served with jasmine rice and pita bread. So now we're going to prepare our 
famous blackened tilapia and grits. Our fish and grits on the menu. Ladies and gentlemen, the sound may not be great, but the food is. This is 6339 Allentown Road, Temple Hills, Maryland, 20748. 301-449-9000. 301-449-9000. Infuse, infuse.com. Infuse it up in Washington today. By now you've probably heard the media's shameful accusation that the NRA wants to put guns in the hands of terrorists. Here's the truth. NRA opposes a law that will prohibit people on the government's terror watch list from buying a firearm. And here's why. The NRA's job is to defend the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment's job is to guarantee the right of law-abiding Americans to defend themselves against crime, tyranny, and yes, terrorism. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but everyone on the terror watch list isn't a terrorist. As a matter of fact, some of these people aren't even potential terrorists. There's a 166-page list just to cover the guidelines for putting somebody on that list. A 2009 Justice Department audit found that 35% of the names on that list never should have been there in the first place. For goodness sakes, they put former U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy on this list. This isn't Minority Report. We don't arbitrarily strip American citizens of their rights based on crimes they haven't committed and a list they're not aware of. If someone is seriously that much of a threat, arrest them and charge them with some shit. When a person they're monitoring shows up to buy a gun and the gun store runs a background check, the authorities know about it immediately. At that point, they either tell the gun store owner to allow the sale or they block it. This is how it's supposed to work which is why the pathetic attempt to demonize the NRA isn't coming from the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, or any other intelligence or law enforcement group. It's coming from the most powerful anti-gun organization on the planet, the mainstream media. No one is pushing this story harder than the New York Daily News. Just a month ago, the same garbage publication called the NRA a terrorist organization and actually called for its 5 million law-abiding members to be placed on the same list. The second the constitutional freedoms of law-abiding American citizens can be denied by a secret government list they have no knowledge of or recourse against, America is no longer a free country, which is precisely what these clowns in the media want. We live in an age of abject refusal to enforce federal gun laws, disregard for immigration law, a weaponized IRS, and endless other examples of political dishonesty and corruption. So to all in the media hoping the secret government list will destroy the Second Amendment, don't be surprised when that list lays waste to the first. If you're a journalist covering the war on terror, if you might have any information about a terrorist or a potential terrorist, if you work with someone who might have any information about a terrorist or a potential terrorist, get ready to be wiretapped and eavesdropped. Get ready for your emails, text messages, and private conversations to be cataloged forever on government servers. Get ready for your voice to be silenced, your stories to be censored, and your freedom to be eviscerated, all in the name of safety. Get ready for all the tyranny you asked for. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you back to New Day Black and Red, broadcasting live out of Philadelphia, PA, 
the city of brotherly love, also home of the benevolent dictator from the conservative commandos radio network, Rick Trader. Uh, also broadcasting over the internet to uh, SHR Media, Conservative Commandos Radio Network, of course. <laughs> uh, High Plains Talk uh, <laughs> Media, and also Rebooting Liberty. We are in the second half of our program. New Day Black and Red, which gives you a constitutional view as well as a spiritual out view of the issues of the day. And so I want to make a headline here. You know in the District of Columbia, Orthodox Jews will be given an opportunity to vote for four hours longer, uh, five, I'm sorry, five hours longer than other non-Orthodox Jews in the D.C. GOP <sighs> caucus. And I know it That's makes a, <laughs> I know it makes a big difference. Um, but here we go, Professor. The number one reason, because it, it was first thought to be a religious liberty thing, uh, why did the Orthodox Jews get privilege over all the other non-Orthodox Jews? Uh, but the truth of the matter is, there is one person who is an Orthodox Jew uh, and has great relations with Orthodox Jews throughout the nation's capital. That one person is Ivana Trump, or Ivanka Trump. And, and so in this particular instance, uh, they want Donald Trump to win in Washington, D.C., and so... They are giving the Orthodox Jews the privilege of having more time to vote since they can't do anything until sundown. Professor, is that constitutional, sir? <laughs> <laughs> well, what the hell happened to the month of early voting? Why couldn't they get it done then? <laughs> it's yeah. not constitutional. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not. Uh, <clears throat> if you're going to do it for one religious group, then you have to do it for all. And what happens? When Ramadan comes around and it happens to be election time, you know, do we have to open up the polls from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. for all the she heads? Uh, no. Uh, we have an election. Now, I'm not even a big fan of early voting. I, I'm against that. But there are avenues that we have legally, and that is early voting and absentee voting. And so if you can't do it because of your religious restrictions, then you'll file for an absentee ballot and you do it and mail it in. And then there's no problem. But in order to do this, this, this smacks of favoritism and discrimination. Uh, even if it's pro-discrimination, it's still discrimination. And, and it's, uh, it's certainly unconstitutional. We have a set of rules, and we need to play by it. The times of the times, uh, the polls are open and closed, and they need to be universal. Yeah. And, uh, and again, I'm against early voting, too. I think we ought to have one day... Uh, and I believe the primary should be like the general election, too, Ken. Uh, we should have uh, all the campaigning, and then we all go on one day, uh, you know, a Tuesday, and we all go in and vote uh, at the country at the same time and pick our candidates for our party. And that they should be closed primaries. Uh, can't party switch to, you know, to screw the, either parties up. I agree and, with and you. And that way we have a universal picture. Uh, but, you know, someone that voted in uh, Iowa, may have uh, a buyer's remorse after they've seen everything that's come out from the campaigns, you know, and they may regret who they voted for, but they can't go back and change it. I think we should all vote based on the same knowledge uh, or the availability. Not everybody's going to know everything, but, you know, we we come together and we have all, all the same knowledge, all the same exposure, and then we go in and we vote and we make our choice, and then they go out and campaign for the general. That's the way it should be. I agree with you. In Texas, uh, yeah. yeah. In Texas, if you have a 10 gallon yarmulke, yarmulke you can go in and vote right. <laughs> so a regular yarmulke isn't good enough. You have to have a 10 gallon one in Texas. <laughs> I need a 10 gallon one because I think I'm going to vote uh, right after sundown. Uh, I want to challenge them. I want to see what can happen. Yeah. Mary Brockman, our beloved Mary Brockman. And what do you call Mary Brockman on your program, sir? She is the Tsarina. 
And on my program, she's the bouncer. Uh, and Mary has a wonderful question. What if the Jews don't vote for Trump? Well, most Jews are going to vote for the Democrats because the Democrats hate them. <laughs> and Jews are self-hating typically, and so they gravitated to people who don't like them too. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe they will. Uh, uh, the orthodox ones anyway. You know, we're not talking about regular Jews or Masonic Jews. We're talking about orthodox ones, right? They tend to be more conservative. Uh, exactly. As far as Jews go. But Jews, Jews in general are a very progressive uh, group. And in the country... Israel is very progressive. You know, it's odd and it's ironic that the conservatives of America are their staunch defenders. But if they ever stop to think about it, you would think it would be the Democrats uh, that would do that because they espouse all these things like, you know, gay marriage and all that is okay over there. And uh, they're very progressive when it comes to politics. No. But, you know, they, I don't know. Can, uh, I don't care who you are or what you are. We have the rule, and that should be abided by, and that there should be no exemptions or exceptions. Uh, and, then, and the thing is, if that was the only day we voted on, then maybe there was an argument. But the fact that they had two or three weeks of early voting they could have done, and absentee balloting is an option, I don't see why we need to make yet another consideration which violates other people's rights in exchange for theirs. Because what happens to the people who are you know, working a double shift and can't go? Or yes! They get their kids who can't go. Or they have six million other reasons why they can't vote, but they want to. And if they have four more hours, they could. So this you know, this is just wrong. And uh, and it shouldn't happen. I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, yeah, that, and that's another thing. The disabled folk, you know, it takes us a long time to get up. And a lot of us don't even bother because it's too big an effort to go down. Yes. So we've got the entire mentally disabled people, or as I like to call it, the Democrat Party. Exactly. They have their problems, too. Exactly. So, these special rights, and I'm glad that we're moving to this because this moves us in the direction of the largesse of the conversation I want to have you have with you in the last quarter of New Day Black and Red, featuring uh, the underground professor, Dr. Michael Jones, uh, and his uh, dimwit sidekick companion uh the exceptional one ken mcclinton uh, yeah. <laughs> i hear in my new contract that i can't mention it's me we don't want you to get a big ego like me <laughs> Special rights. Now, apparently, the law cabinet, I don't know what's happening in Dallas or in other places of the country, because uh, I'm confined to Washington, D.C., and I don't think or read outside of it. Um, but in Washington, D.C., the law cabinet Republicans have virtually cr created a political jihad. They have virtually taken over uh, the D.C. GOP. Uh, and they side with the LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ community on very many issues. They believe in special rights, human rights. Professor, I want your opinion on human rights in terms of its application to the Constitution. Well, you know, what, what the heck's a human right? So they mean God-given rights, okay? As humans, we have rights that God gave us, but we don't have special ones because of our race or because of our religion. Uh, rights are rights because of our birth, because mm -hmm. God gave them to us. And, and too often we ascribe things to being a right when they're not, like health care. Health care is not, not a right. Uh, defending your life is. And, and so we misconstrue that too often, and we think, you know, people have rights. But for the other thing is you don't even have a right to vote for president. You know, you don't vote for president in this country. You get to choose the electors. They go to the convention to choose the candidate. And then later you choose the electors to vote for president uh, out of the electoral college. And so... Um, the people who have a right to vote are the state legislators, according to the Constitution. 
and the state legislatures, uh, in their good sense, uh, suborn that to the we the people and give us the chance to go out and do that. But the only people we directly elect are our state representatives and our, and our national representatives. Mm -hmm. well, and, of course, now the senators, too, because of the idiotic uh, amendments to the Constitution that destroyed people's civil rights, didn't give it to them. Now, in terms of these preferences, uh, according to the preamble, uh, welfare, <laughs> and I'm being facetious here, Professor. You don't have to correct me. Yeah. <laughs> you do know there's an L in that word, right? It's welfare. Yeah. <laughs> welfare. Uh, <laughs> welfare. 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 Uh, <laughs> We're supposed to have welfare according to the preamble. So what's your problem, Professor? I'm sorry, I was, I was talking to my periscope. What? <laughs> uh, we're supposed to have welfare according to the U.S. Pre uh, Constitution's preamble. Uh, general welfare? All right. Uh, the right for the general, yeah. Well, that's really giving, uh, giving aid and comfort to general officers of the United States Army. That's, that's what that means. What? General, uh, is to give uh, welfare is to be given only to generals, you know, like Patton and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and Eisenhower, Schwarzkopf, and Lee, you know, those guys. Yeah, yeah, Schwarzkopf, <laughs> Colin Powell. Yeah, but it's not that doesn't mean you are. It just uh, that is you know during the arguments and debates over whether or not the Constitution should be ratified and the ratification debates as well. It was laughed at by the quote unquote Federalists who claimed that no one would be so imbecilic. You know, the anti Federalists said that's what's going to happen. They're going to say the Constitution says that we need to provide welfare people. And the, and the Federalists said that's imbecilic. No one would be so stupid as to think providing for the general welfare would mean that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not so much. People can't keep people a lot of that stupid, and and I hear the argument all the time, even from other political scientists, professors who claim that, and it only takes about three minutes of research on the Constitution to realize that that's just stupidest, stupidest uh, uh, to the maximus. But um, uh, it's just flowery language, and and it's a preamble anyway, so it's not binding. It's just a set up so you can understand the thinking of the people who wrote the Constitution. But the general welfare meant simply that it's like the pursuit of happiness. It means that government's job is to create conditions for us to go out in our own merits and our own favors go out and accomplish something, and then to reap the rewards, i.e., we have a right to profit off of our own sweat, off of our own labor. Mm -hmm. No other man has a right to the profit of your labor, and no government has the, prop, the right to profit off your labor. Uh, subsequently, you know, that's what the whole Civil War was over. You know, uh, to some people, uh, it wasn't, but, you know, the end result was that one of the decisions, or one of the questions being asked in this country was, do we have a right to profit off other men's labor? And the answer became, no, you do not. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then subsequently, the Democrat Party has spent the last hundred something years saying, uh, "No, that question hadn't been answered because we still want to profit off of other people's labor," and i.e., the institution of welfare. And it is an institution now. When we hear stories of people going into the welfare office and they introduce their children to their welfare agent or whatever you call them, social worker, and their introduction is. She, if she's still here, she may be your welfare uh, agent too when you're old enough for welfare on your own. Wow. Meaning that they have no hope, that they believe that generationally they will be trapped in welfare forever. And if you go and look at the stats, many families are, uh, you know, which is, uh, which is sad. And it's not helping them, uh, it's enslaving them. Now, and it's stealing their souls too, because I, you know, as I've said many times, I believe that this is the fast track to hell, is taking other people's money uh, that you don't deserve. But it's theft. It's no different accepting a welfare check when you don't need it. And I mean need it. 
accepting one is no different than walking into my, my house and saying, you know, I like your TV and your toaster. I think I'll take it. But, but, because that's what they're doing. They're but professor, rid of you some, uh, professor, you things. just don't understand, sir. I know that you're talking constitutional babbly book and everything, but we gave up the Constitution when we hired George W. Bush. Uh, so, uh, this <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> right but you're, you're, you're wrong about this, Ken. I do understand. I'm a misogynist. <laughs> oh, we love the underground professor. Uh, <laughs> but here goes. If the government doesn't take care of poor people, especially you know the ones, them folk, if they don't take care of poor people, who's going to take care of them? If Hillary doesn't take care of them, if Bernie doesn't take care of them, who's going to take care of them? Isn't it our role, our job, to take care of the poor? Well, yes, Ken. Uh, you and I have a responsibility as children of God to do so. Uh, but that responsibility falls on us. And if we fail... Then we, but we shouldn't be answering to Washington D.C. And the idea that we are being charitable by having the government forcibly take tax money from us to give to people who don't work is is a disconnect for me. Or even better, that we're going to China and borrowing forty cents on the dollar to give to them, not to work, and we're in debting our own children. You know, to the point where every child born owes a million dollars to the government instantly. You know, that's their share of the debt. Uh, we can't continue this. But, you know, this is interesting, Ken. Is in our country, we took care of, of the people who had needs. Um, if you go and look at the histories of the uh, towns and cities in our country, people would show up without jobs, and they'd be told to keep moving. So don't stop here because we don't have a job for you. <laughs> Yeah, if they didn't, and uh, because they didn't want to burden the citizens there who all went to church, and they didn't want to burden them by having to pick up the responsibility for taking care of this person. And so they required either a demonstration of wealth or a job for them to stay. Now, if you continue, the people who did live in the city, if they hurt their hand, you know, hit it with a hammer or something while they were working, then all the neighbors kicked in and fed them and helped took care of the kids and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, because they did their, and a neighbor. Now, the Republican Party, and this may surprise you, but the Republican Party came by and said, you know what? I bet you we can corral some votes. So this happened up in the city. I bet you we can get some votes. If when all of these immigrants come off this boat, they come up and then we tell them, Here's a place you can stay. Here's a job. Go check out tomorrow. You've got a job. And all we ask is you vote for us on election day. And they created ward bosses, you know, political precinct captains and bosses and whatnot, and became very good at it. The Democrats, it took them a while to spin up on this, but then they, they made us look like amateurs. Yeah. <laughs> One day, they got it. But the problem was, is then the Republican uh, Party uh, and the Democrat Party took this burden away from the church, which is an other charitable organization. So, societies are families, you know, they would join the Odd Fellows or the uh, and uh, and they knew that those groups would take their, their, their spouses if they died or anything. Uh, so, we got rid of those for the most part. And we got rid of churches taking care of people, and the, the parties were doing it. Well, it became too big a burden for the Republican and Democrat parties to keep this up on any substantial basis. So they turned and they said, you know what, we're going to give it to government. And mm. they made this deal where, you know, this way uh, the Republicans and the Democrats could funnel their people to the government and still get credit. This is how the Republicans bought in on it. But what we didn't realize is that we were creating infrastructure of a fifth element of government called bureaucrats and that they would soon become the real leaders of our country <laughs> untouchable unelectable unfireable and they were the ones who created the welfare rules and laws and distributed the money and re 
redistributed wealth, and the Democrats became the party of government, and the government employees then became Democrats because of that, and the rest became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Professor, there are those Hello. there are those that tell us, and because you are such a wise man, I love coming to the mountaintop to ask you questions. May I ask, ask me anything? Thank please. you. I want to ask you this question. Um, there are those that believe that there is a correlation between the amount of money that's redistributed with the ability for one party to care for a group of people more than another group of people. Uh, is that false narrative? Is that hyperbole? Is that merely watching the myth grow after all these years? Well, let me ask you, I'll answer you by asking you a question. Let me ask you this. You're going to ask me something? I'm a welfare person. <laughs> I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to put you on the spot. Tell me all the welfare programs the Republicans got rid of. None. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the ones that they did, and they did it for just a couple of years while Bill Clinton was president, and he signed it into law. But then they reversed everything. And so all the welfare reforms that we had, that, that Kasich brags about, uh, they're all gone. And it only lasts a couple of years. Now, they were fantastic because the people on welfare dropped off substantially mm -hmm. and uh, during the welfare reform period in our country. But for the most part, they haven't. So what my point is, is that Republicans are trying to be like Democrats by giving away the store, thinking, well, if we promise stuff, then they'll vote for us, too. The problem is, is, why would you vote for people that promise almost as much as the other party does? So you stick with the real thing. That's like, you know, having a, a Coke or, or, or drinking zero Pepsi or zero Coke. Ew. Coke is, that, that Coke that didn't watch. Real, real Coke. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, why do it? Exactly. Stick the real thing. Um, now, the, the interesting thing is, is that we aren't helping these people at all. Mm -hmm. that are on welfare. We're, we're simply not. And we're causing irreparable harm to them. We've taken away their pride and their dignity, their reliance on themselves, their love of work and doing a good job. We've taken away the, the man from the family and his responsibility to provide and protect the family. And we turned women into uh, baby-making machines by offering more money for every kid that they pop out yep. and, uh, and providing every social service that we can under the sun. Uh, to, you know, something weird just popped in my head as I was thinking about all that, Ken, and that was, uh, you know how the, all the reports are coming out that the Democrats, only half of them are voting and the Republicans have twice as many? Yes. Uh, and they said that this is because of Trump. Well, something interesting occurred to me, and I went and looked at today, and most of the states where Democrat voting has dropped in half mm -hmm. are the states that required voter ID. Wow! Wow! So I meant to talk about that on my show tonight, and I forgot, amongst the many other things I wanted to talk about tonight, but uh, uh, the voter ID has blocked many, or, or a lot of fraudulent voters haven't even bothered to show up to try and vote. And that's the real reason that Democrats are seeing about a 43% reduction in the amount of people voting. Wow, that is huge. Absolutely, positively huge. So so literally, I think so. <laughs> it, it, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. No, but in all seriousness, that is a very serious indictment of a party that used to sign people up in the cemetery. So l literally, we learned on my show a few weeks back that poor people don't vote, generally. Uh, and and it well, well, if you're not going to bother working, why would you bother voting? Exactly! It doesn't <laughs> make sense! <laughs> and Carrie, Carrie Donovan put it so well in, in the interview earlier uh, that Basically, there's no investment in America. Uh, poverty doesn't require an investment. Uh, it just requires maintenance. Uh, <laughs> and, and quite, right. 
c quite frankly, I, I you got nothing to lose. I, I mean, if you vote, you can lose something. So don't vote. So pov impoverished people don't vote. And now we're learning that Democrats don't vote because ID is required, which was one of the biggest fears of the poverty pimps like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, right? Well, yeah. I mean, look, you know, when you want to say that welfare doesn't help people and no one gets rich off it, I have to beg the difference, and that is that the people you just named have become very wealthy. And in fact, you know, look what we did to Leona Helmsley because she was white and she didn't pay a few, uh, you know, dollars in taxes on, on, on her income. Um, but look at, uh, we have political people, you know, Bernie Sanders meeting with tax cheaters that owe millions of dollars to the government. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, you've seen that picture, right, of, uh, of Sharpton and, uh, and Sanders together? Eden? Yep, yep. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and he owes millions of dollars in taxes, uh, but, you know, they, and they become rich off of this. So the poverty pimps are uh, making a lot of money off of this, but the other people only get enough money to keep them addicted to staying on welfare and not risking going to work. And the way the way jobs pay, it's it's it is a very big disincentive to welfare people to get off their asses and go get a job because if they can make you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year on welfare with all the things combined. Yep. Then why would they go out and get a thirty-five or fifty thousand dollar a year job? Yes. You no, know, it doesn't make any sense economically. And so, you know, you've got to ask yourself, why is welfare designed the way it is? Well, it's designed to keep people there. It's it's that. If we were actually to say, okay, everybody on welfare, you have to come down every day and get your food for that day, and when we don't give you any money. Uh, and if you have, you know, we'll, we'll take care of your housing, but if it, if it costs more than, than say, uh, 20 bucks a day, then, you know, that's all you get. Yeah. We'll provide you a cot at the YMCA, and we'll give you a can of beans and, you know, and a can of uh, mandarin oranges and, a, and, you know, <laughs> and an apple and, or whatever. And we give them substance food, enough to keep them alive for one day. And then if they want to do it all over again, they can do it tomorrow. It would be about a week before everybody was off of welfare, except those that are truly needy. And then those we could actually go and help. We could send them to the churches and other charitable organizations that are non-church oriented and take care of these people. But, you know, most people, it's a lifestyle. And then you go on welfare, and if they go get a job, they lose benefits. So what do they do? They, they get under the table jobs where they work for cash or they become criminals and they run drugs or numbers or do other things which is why so, which is why cash good. which is why cash on the street is very important during a campaign uh, because they can put cash in right. people's pockets uh, for for a vote uh, you're, you're voting for your best interest yourself uh, in this regard uh, we're talking today with the underground professor uh, dr. Michael Jones uh, who is just a brilliant man uh, who is not favored well oh, by sure. not favored well by his good friend who doesn't return his phone calls in a timely manner. Uh, who's especially when he's like concerned for his friend's health. <laughs> Ow! Ouch! <laughs> and like Dad said, we won't mention any names. We won't. <laughs> Dr. Michael Jones and his sidekick, the exceptional one, Kim McClinton, on New Day Black and Red, giving you a constitutional and spiritual picture. Before I go to the biblical study portion of favoritism here, I want to ask you about uh, the presidential candidates who happen to be on the right side of the lever. Uh, Cruz, Trump, Rubio, and some guy from Ohio that Mary's trying to get rid of by being president. So he doesn't have to come back to Ohio. Uh, <laughs> you don't blame him. Yeah, that perfect sense. And you said to the right, are you sure you want to include Trump in that? Because I'm fairly certain he's 
to the left of Hillary. Well, he said on Monday that he was to the right, on Tuesday to the left, Wednesday to the right. So as of right now, and, he's to the right. So. <laughs> well, on Thursday, he said Ted Cruz wanted about everything he said, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> he could be to the left today. But don't these guys also perpetrate the poverty uh, narrative and, and this rush to be a middle class? Isn't the job of American to be rich? I just always thought that that was the purpose. Well, God, I thought it was, too, when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're not a millionaire by 30, you screwed up. But, you know, now I've lived in reality, and I understand that a little better, especially since I screwed up. But uh, I, I'm convinced, Ken, that if you are poor in this country, you do so because you're a volunteer. Honestly. Yeah. If you're on welfare, I think you're a volunteer. Uh, and if you're poor, you're a volunteer because it doesn't take too much to get out of it. You know, do the math. If you were willing to work 16 hours a day at two minimum wage jobs that you get, well, then within a few weeks, you would be out of minimum wage because they would promote you for doing a good job and working hard. And then you would start making more and more money and you save your money and then you, you know, go out and buy some nice suits, go get some education, drop one of the jobs, keep one, go out and look for better jobs, you get a better life, you get promoted. Uh, there's ways to get out of poverty. In fact, you know, all you have to do to avoid poverty in this country statistically is to get a high school diploma, get married, then have kids, and oh, I'm skipped a step. High school diploma, get a job, get yep. married, have kids. You do it in that order, then you can avoid poverty in this country, barring some cataclysmic event. But um, no, sir, the, there is a huge disconnect in our country when it comes to these things. Mm -hmm. And the country has a lot of wealth and a lot of opportunity, and you have a right to profit off of your own labor. The problem is you have to get off your butt and go labor. You have to go do things. And too many of us can sit here and tell you who's on Dancing with the Stars and which chick got dissed on Bachelorette. Mm -hmm. But uh, but we, we don't know who our own congressmen are. We don't know what the issues are. And we go in there and we vote because they got a good set of hair or they have an R or a D next to their name or they promised us a lot of freebies at our unconstitutional gift. Uh, and and so, you know, our country is doomed for this if we don't get out of that cycle. Exactly. We don't have the money anymore. And it's unconstitutional to begin with. And we're getting a lot of uh, agreements and stuff. Hit the hearts, baby, on the periscope. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, with our, and now let me ask you something. I got another question I want to ask you. You want to ask me uh, something? Oh, my goodness. That's two axes. <laughs> explain me this, sir. Explain me this. <laughs> On my show tonight, earlier I was talking about Ben Carson endorsing the Donald. The Donald who called him a pedophile, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Uh, and ca he called him a uh, a parent. Uh, what is it when you lie a lot? <laughs> uh, Ted Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> he called him Ted Cruz. So, pathological liar. There we go. Pathological liar. That's what he called uh, uh, Carson, a pathological liar, and that he was a liar about being uh, involved in a stabbing incident in his youth. Uh, that the right, yeah, and that his job as a surgeon that he was basically a pedophile too. So I ask you, with all those things, why in the world did he endorse Trump and not Rubio or Kasich? You know, because I can see why he didn't do Ted Cruz or, or just withhold an endorsement. But he, he chose Trump. And that, that shows me something seriously wrong with his character. Uh, I, maybe I had misjudged Carson because I respected him and I was hoping he would run again. Uh, but I'm not so sure. I can go that way anymore. Well, Mary, Mary the Tsarina wants to correct us. Um, Mary says that that report was from PRNTLY, yeah. and I don't think Carson endorsed him. So, uh, No, it hasn't yet. The reports are, and, and, and I have them from three different sources, but the, the reports are that Carson has decided to 
endorse Trump if they haven't made the official uh, endorsement. There you go. And he'll probably wait till uh, after. I think it's Printly, anyway. Uh, I've never heard of Printly. I think it's like an onion kind of thing. Uh, so, oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, so, but the bottom line is that uh, Dr. Carson didn't know when to leave, uh, and he certainly doesn't know who to endorse well. So, uh, two strikes. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, Professor, it's great having you on New Day Black and Red, and this is probably why it is the best radio show on Saturday afternoons anywhere in America, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, New Day Black and Red, featuring the underground professor, Dr. Michael Jones, that can be heard on High Plains Talk, Rebooting Liberty, SHR Media, and Conservative Commandos Radio Network. Yours truly, the exceptional one, can be heard on all of those particular things. Mary says Trump lies. That has not been proven. That has not been proven. Trump does not say he lies. <laughs> Ted Cruz says Trump lies, and we know Ted Cruz lies, so that means Trump tells the truth. That's right. Uh, I'm looking at this, Ken, real quick. Yeah. The New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, and Fox News are all reporting that Carson is going to endorse Trump. Carson will endorse Trump. So I don't know what the print thing is, but yeah, that's that's just about every major, you know, the Blaze, the Daily Beast, uh, ABC News, Yahoo News, Twitter mm -hmm. News, they're all saying this, so... So, uh, you know, you know it's, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's every major news organization is reporting it. It's only true if it shows up in the National Enquirer. Yeah, <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> hey, Ken, would, uh, I, I, I hate to say this, but I've got to I've gotta eat and go to bed. Can you carry the Bible thing for the last 20 minutes, or do you need me to hang? No, no, I can carry the Bible thing, uh, which most people will be leaving at this point anyway. So, <laughs> well... Normally, I tune in so that I can go to sleep, but... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Ken, we're being asked to announce Bernie Sanders' endorsement uh, by uh, by Dave Milner. <laughs> Dave Milner is oh, no, endorsing. No, by, yeah. Bernie uh, Sanders is endorsing the balance, yes. No, Bernie Sanders is endorsing... Got to, got to understand that that's powerful right there. Uh, two men of... Oh, yes. Financial means. Bernie Sanders gets. Uh, Bernie Sanders said he'll endorse him if he gets free Trump adult underwear for life and pre-chewed Trump steaks, so he doesn't <laughs> have to use his false teeth. <laughs> as long as they pass USDA, it's still good for the burnster. All right, Professor. God before, bless you. Uh, yeah, before you get into this, do a plug for uh, Freedom Fest, and I'll see you guys in Dallas. Thank you, sir. Uh, first and foremost, yeah. the professor, Liz Loris, I believe Sean Lewis from Sackheads Radio, Dan Butcher from High Plains Media. We will all be uh, at the Texas GOP convention in May. Uh, all arrangements have been made. I will be there. Liz Loris will be there. Uh, and, of course, the professor. Uh, and so we're excited about that opportunity of coming together once more as a family. <laughs> Uh, and then, in July, the big, big show. And there are big announcements that come along the way in terms of the big show. And I want to keep you all abreast of those. Uh, but other than Freedom Fest 2016, we are so looking forward to being there. George Foreman will be the honorary speaker uh, at this particular event. Um, and... Yeah, we're just excited about this particular opportunity. We already have headline status uh, as a broadcasting organization. Uh, we come together, High Place Talk Radio, Rebooting Liberty, SHR Media, Conservative Committee. We all come together, and we have one spot uh, where we are the superstars at Freedom Fest. Everyone gets uh, interviewed by us, and we're excited by that standard. So. We're looking forward to it. Well, you heard Trump was afraid of that, right? That when he found out that George Foreman was going to be grilling weenies, Trump <laughs> said, oh, no, wait, my hands are small. <laughs> Good night, buddy. Good night, sir. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to direct your attentions to what does the Bible say about favoritism. 
Well, good night, everybody. Good Let's night. Call this <laughs> good night, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, what does the Bible say about favoritism? Well, any type of partiality or bias is ungodly in his eyes. We shouldn't discriminate based on the conditions of social class and status, wealth, whether you got the new Jordans or you're wearing the new DKNY, whether you shop at Macy's or the general store, whether you are a fan of having large sums of money or if you just like living off the edge. We should never discriminate <clears throat> based on those particular things. I want you to understand that the Bible is very clear when it comes to the whole concept of partiality. And I know a lot of people will say, well, Ken, doesn't God love the Jews? Especially the Orthodox Jews who have five additional hours of vote in D.C. on Saturdays. Well, that may be because of the decision that he made that the Jews were the apple of his eye, but I'm quite certain he didn't involve himself in D.C. GOP politics. God doesn't show favoritism. And I know that there are lots of people that pre preach the liberation theology, whether it's in <clears throat> evangelical churches in the Midwest, or southern churches, or black churches in the East, or Hispanic churches on the West. But God doesn't have favorites. He doesn't. He doesn't play the gambit of win, place, or show. According to Romans chapter 2, verse 11, it reads, For God shows no partiality. He would not be God if he did. Now, some people would say, well, doesn't he show partiality for the sinner? Well, yes, he does in this sense. He gives you the opportunity to ask for the forgiveness of your sins, to surrender your authority as your own God to him as the Lord and creator of the heavens and the earth. As the one who only begotten son saved us by being hung on a cross and through his resurrected power was able to hand off the baton to the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. Now that salvation was not for just a few but for the many. But not a collective salvation merely because your daddy or your mommy was saved are you saved. He doesn't show favoritism in that regard. Your salvation is an individualistic one. You see, before God, all are equal. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. And it reads, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Now I want to put these particular verses in the chat roll for you to have an opportunity to review at your leisure. But we're understanding right now, based on the Word of God, and not on merely an interpretation by me, that God really doesn't look at you and preference over your sister or your brother. To him... You are equal unto each other. You don't have to march. You don't have to fight. You don't have to pass a law. In God's eyes, we are his creation. Now, in Colossians 3.25, it teaches that even God's own judgments are fair and just. I get this all the time for individuals who talk about it's not fair that somebody has a million dollars and I don't have that. Well, according to God, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, 
and there's no partiality. You see, ill-begotten gain will be paid back either here or beyond. There is a payback. But just because you stole a can of soup and another man stole a million dollars doesn't make him worse than you. You are both thieves in the eyes of God. He is not partial to the take. He is partial to those who admit, repent, ask for forgiveness, and turn around. But Ken, you just said he's not partial. He's not, he's not showing favoritism. Well, favoritism in this particular sense, that you have an option, an obligation, a duty to accept that your Lord and Savior, who is greater than thee, certainly has ramifications and punishments for those who seek to do evil in his creation. Now, the Bible also teaches that Christians are not to show favoritism. We're, we're certainly are not supposed to show favoritism. But, Ken, you're married. Aren't you supposed to show favoritism to your wife? Don't get stupid. My wife, who is still trying to find proof that she said I do, I love Mrs. Biggs, uh, receives my preferential love unlike anyone else. I show her. Now, is she always satisfied with my love? No, because I'm human. But God isn't me, and I'm not God. In James 2.1, it says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. That you not pick one believer over another, but you love them, with the same uncontemptible love that Christ had for you. In the Old Testament, we are taught, ye shall do no injustice in court. Ye shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall judge your neighbor with righteousness. Unrighteousness is a perversion. Righteousness is not a perversion. One of the things that God tells us in the New Testament is that we're supposed to seek God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness shall be added to you. Partiality towards God over my partiality to discriminate against my neighbor. Hence, I love my neighbor as I love myself, I love myself as I love God. Partiality and favoritism. God doesn't want you to have that. God doesn't want you when Donald Trump walks into the room to get up out of your chair and offer him a seat and when a poor person comes into the room, turn your head. The context concerns the treatment of the rich, the poor, and the church. Sometimes we treat with dastard nature the poor. But God says, when you would, do them good. Not obligated to every time someone comes around you, but when you would, treat them good. In Exodus 23.3, God says, Nor shall ye be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. They done me wrong. I was supposed to get more than I actually earned. You are supposed to see in my poverty that I am owed a sentence that's far lesser than the crime that has been dealt. When you do evil, and judgment is on the earth. If you have killed a man and you are poor, you should not be treated any differently if you were rich. That means the best lawyers should be availed you. And as well, no privilege given 
to an individual because of his wealth or because of his poverty. See, the environmental excuses that we use today in the courtroom are facetious and should not be used at all if it were to be the courtroom in Christ. Christ says, I am to be content in every condition, no matter if I'm rich or poor, Jew or Gentile. I am to be content in my condition. So in my contentment, in my condition, doesn't mean that I am complacent, but I'm content. Today I am poor, tomorrow I might be a millionaire. But in God's eye, he loves me just the same. I need to love you, and you need to love me in the same manner. In James 2, 8 through 9, it is written, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Yes, my friends. When you go to church and you create a cult of personality for the pastor, you are committing sin. When you create a clique in your church, and refuse to get out of that click, you're committing sin. And I know how you like to only Bible study with a few folk and pray with a few people because they get you. But the truth of the matter is, you're being sinful. But Ken, I only got a few people I can share with, and God's not taking any privilege of that from you. In fact, sometimes there are only a few people that you can share with. But God is saying, is the pastor the only one you can pray with in this church and know that I'm with you always, even until the end? Uh, is Miss Agnes, Miss Margaret, and Miss Lisa the only ones you can actually be in a Bible study with? And if someone else brings a Bible over to you, you're offended? If Joe Blow, who just joined the church, has been there for 30 days and he knows nobody, been waiting for someone not just to give him the outstretched arm of fellowship, but the outstretched hand of friendship, and no one goes to him? If you're choosing your friends because he's in a wheelchair, and, you know, that would really not really work well when we go out, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. God is saying to us that in order for us to truly change this world, we need to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and we need to love ourselves as we love God. We need to not be a favorite. Now, Zarina, the bouncer, the one who is loved more, than Ken loves. These are all different radio personalities, different individuals, and Mary supports them all. She doesn't show favoritism one to any other. She listens to each and every one of them, and she encourages them every step of the way. My bouncer's been with me for six years, and I love her dearly. I love her and I recognize her gift, and her gift gets rewarded differently than other gifts. Dave, I love as well, who's been with me for a while. I reward him by playing his blogs. Different way of rewarding gifts, but I love them both equally. So here it is for church leaders, and I will close with this. Are you showing favoritism in your church? 1 Timothy 5.21 says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. You want to change the world? You want to change your church? Maybe if you step out of bounds 
and know them better, man. Stop showing favoritism. The world will change. I want to thank everyone from uh, Conservative Commandos Radio ne Network, uh, the most benevolent dictator, Rick Trader. We love you dearly. Uh, also, SHR Media, High Plains Talk Media, and Rebooting Liberty. We love you all the same. No favoritism. We appreciate you greatly for tuning in from Delaware, New Jersey, and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, especially out of the city of brotherly love. A man told me once, in order to be brave, you can't live cowardly. I promise you I will always be brave. And I want you to remember, God blessed America. Now it's time for America to bless God. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.